welcome to Newsreel 96. This year we look at the ups and downs of our national game, the usual fun day activities, a charity walk over Pendle, the revival of a May Queen celebration, has someone finally discovered the mysteries of the Loch Ness Monster? Also, a couple of celebrities visit the area. In June, it was the return of a nightmare on Elm Street. There is also the long-awaited demise of a Burnley eyesore. First, how the fortunes of success can change. A couple of years ago, Jimmy Mullen took Burnley to Wembley, where they beat Stockport to gain promotion to Division One. This season, after a run of poor results, the so-called 333 Club staged a most strange protest at precisely 3.33 on February the 10th during the game against Crew Alexander at Turf Moor, a hooter was sounded. This was the signal for the 333 protester to turn their backs on the game, which some did. It was a most strange sight. A short time after this game, Mr Mullen left Turf Moor. On March the 24th, the Health Education Department at Burnley General Healthcare invited Zach Dingle, the lovable rogue from Emmerdale, to join young and old at Townley Park to promote a new health campaign. After photographs for the local papers, Zach, Burnley-based actor Steve Halliwell, found plenty of time to chat to fans and sign autographs before leading the way for a 30-minute walk around the park. The event is part of a three-year campaign to persuade Couch Potatoes to spend more time getting fit. Good Friday at Barden Mill meant a trip down memory lane for some older visitors. A live monkey to offer a shoulder to an owl to stroke plus a barrel organ to listen to were the attractions arranged by Mill Managing Director Jason Files. The idea was to hark back to the days when one of the main attractions at Easter was Jack Moore's Monkey. Clyde, owned by Barry Crabtree, and James Harris's owl were very popular and seemed to be enjoying their day as much as anyone. While all this was going on, a bit to boost business in Burnley was taking shape in the town centre.
Burnley Council had arranged plenty of street entertainment for Good Friday shoppers. The day was a great success and store managers were very pleased with the trade the entertainers had attracted. The 23rd of April is of course St George's Day. Townley Park was again the venue for the annual celebrations. The 23rd of this year being a Tuesday, Sunday the 21st was the day Burnley folk turned out to relax and spend a day watching the kids enjoy all the fun of the fair. The bright start to the day was most encouraging. It made preparation for the event much easier. The day ahead was once again a great success. One of our reporters was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time on a day in April where the fire brigade were called to an incident on Curzon here Street. We are. We're here on the spot, the Broken Reporter, with the camera crew, and we're here with Burnley Fire Brigade with an action packed fire over there. We don't know quite what's going on, whether it's uh, fish and chips alight or quite what's alight, but something's definitely alight over there. Uh, I think I might go and interview that young lady over there, but uh, she may not like it actually. There seems to be quite a lot of kerfuffle going on in there, we're not quite sure. The chap there is on his mobile phone, I think they're calling for reinforcements. So uh, there could be something quite drastic going on here in Burnley. On April the 27th, the third annual Pendle Which Way Challenge Walk was enthusiastically contended by a group of walkers keen to raise money to fund a new headquarters for the Pendle Forest Scout and Guide Group. They set out on a 25-mile gruelling walk around the Pendle Hill area. Barley Village Hall was once again the headquarters and committee chairman Ted Pemberton was once again overseeing the proceedings. Did he have his tension? After some words of encouragement, the walk was officially started by councillor Sheila Derwent. <laughs> we asked organiser Gwen Nutter how the fund was going. Well, we've got 30 odd thousand. We, we, want, we need 90 odd thousand. We've got enough to get up to the base, which is what we're planning to do. We're going out for tenders at the moment, I think, and then when we've got the base. We're hope we've applied for some lottery money, you see. I'm hoping. <laughs> Why not? Who is <laughs> So I don't know. Well, where is it going to be? Um, next door to St Anne's Church Hall. The 16! 
There were 14 checkpoints along the route, making sure no one got lost, and Raynet provided the communications network. Again, for the third year running, the weather was fine. Back at HQ, the organisers were checking progress. And it wasn't too long before the first walker got back. Although it has to be said, Lee Thompson ran the course, and in a good time. Linda Platt was the first lady home in a time of 4 hours 55 minutes. There were no serious problems, but of the 132 that started, this poor lady unfortunately had to retire with an ankle injury. After negotiations, the target for the project is now £75,000. £1,200 was raised from the event which makes the amount now achieved £40,000. Work on the site is hoping to start this month with the car park. May the 5th of this year was a very busy day for our reporters. A mini stock car event, a fun day on Sycamore Avenue, and another at the Stone Trough Inn, Kelbrook, were covered. The mini stock car racing took place at the Hesenford Industrial Estate and attracted a number of enthusiastic contestants and spectators. The contestants worked in teams, one controlling the car, with the other members having the hazardous job of correcting the car if it crashes or stops for any reason. One-eighth scale radio-controlled stock car racing was organised by Northern Oval Racing Affiliation and sponsored by Bronte Model Shop. I suppose for them it was just another day at the races. Also on May the 5th, the Canal Tunnel and Forage celebrated 200 years and reporter Alf Price was there to record the event. Alf also took advantage of the situation by going for a ride on the canal barge that was taking trips up and down a section of the canal. The tunnel, which was built at a cost of some 40 lives, was opened on May the 3rd, 1796, 
The opening 200 years ago was an event that was reported all over the world because of the scale of the achievement. The usual rides and side stalls were to be taken advantage of on Sycamore Avenue later on that day. This fun day was an annual event organised by the 1st Burnley Boys Brigade. It certainly looked as if we were in for another hot summer. One thing is for sure, a good time was had by all. takes from Townley Park. About 10 miles away, more entertainment was being provided for customers of the Old Stone Trough at Kelbrook, organised by landlord Jonathan Whittle as a fundraising day for the Macmillan nurses. up a bit, back off, throw it, and every so often that egg gets so warm. The Whittles certainly entered into the spirit of the occasion. Let's have a look. Hey. Well, as you said, they didn't do anything for laugh here, the old stone drop. Um, we're hoping to raise money for Macmillan nurses today and we've organised the event here, which is the first we've done uh, while our, our company's been here and we hope to raise several hundred pounds for them. Local companies have been involved with the support of uh, rough prices and everything so there's too many to mention but uh, I'd like to thank them for their participation and help. busy weekend in Burnley was highlighted by a visit from a Member of Parliament who is undoubtedly the most regular attendant in the House of Commons. Dennis Skinner can always be seen on the front row and on the left of the Speaker almost every day. Every day that is except Monday May the 6th because that day he was in Burnley marching with the May Day Parade and then to open celebrations to Townley Park. We've got microphones in Parliament, you know. You've probably seen them, they hang down from roof. And they try and get one to split me on my face in two. That's when Betty Boothroyd allows me to speak. I mean, I have to struggle every single day. Mind you, Pete's there every day as well. But it's, uh, it's important that when you get to Parliament that you understand what your job is. And that is to represent your class. And May Day is about the collective strength of working class people and their families. So is there any middle class people here? <laughs> Anybody that shifted the coal out of the bath into the BD? <laughs> you can always tell them, you know. They are John provocateurs, they might be one of you. They always come with the flat caps on. And then they go and buy them from Harrods. So it is about working class strength. And it's about socialism. 
Some park people might imagine. Mr Skinner kept Paula McCoy, the Burnley Express reporter, busy with a shorthand. Loch Ness. But no, this is not the monster. It's only Linda Eccles. We step back now to April for this late news item. Linda, owner of the uh, bottle shop Glenfield Road Nelson, and her friend Michael Bradshaw were concerned about the struggle the churches are having in Nelson to raise money. So they decided to do something about it. Well, we, we needed to raise money. That was the big thing. And Every, every week you come out to church and they were fought with buckets and baskets and begging bowls. And I just got to the stage where I thought, well, fuck it, every week they'd be giving like, it'd dwindle. It sorted off like £50 would be donated one week and then a couple of weeks after it'd be down to like 30 and then barrels were raising £5. And I thought, people are really just fed up, we're just giving money. And the only thing to do is either give them something for the money or do something so ridiculous that, that they'll think, well, there's no chance they'll do that, I'll probably keep my money anyway. So actually it was Michael's idea to swim Loch Ness. That actually wasn't mine. On the 17th of April, they travelled to Loch Ness in Scotland to attempt to swim across the murky surface from shore to shore. And then I thought, I really had got worked up. I lost weight, I couldn't eat, I had diarrhoea, I was terrible. I was foul-tempered. It, it, I really had got panicked. What's going to be? I'm going to be cold. Really cold for over an hour, and then I thought, well, yeah, but you know, like people who were not over cautious, but. Perhaps a little protective of you saying, you mustn't do this, and if you do this, and, and at the first sign of this, you must get out. I thought I were doing something really. They made it sound like it was like really life threatening, and it wasn't. We asked Linda what churches they were raising money for. Well, if for two churches, Michael, Michael swam it for all his service in Nelson, and I swam it. That was for their uh, dry rot fund, as they call it. And I swam it, swam it, I swam it <laughs> for um, St John Southworth, they now call it, on every street. They are, they're, they're building as concrete cancer, so each, each week services in a, a dilapidated old school room and they needed kitchen funds. They do, they're a very active parish, they do a um, couple of luncheon clubs a week and all sorts of old folk. So they needed a lot of kitchen equipment, so I, I did it to raise money for them. Go on, please, right. After a tang of apprehension, Linda was on her way. One of the dangers of a swim like this is the risk of the swimmer perhaps getting lost. A short lack of concentration by the people on the boat, and they could easily lose sight of her. About halfway across, however, there was a moment of drama. I can't go that fast. Fortunately, it wasn't long before they got it started again, and Linda was none the wiser. 
We asked Linda how she felt at the end of her swim. That wonderful. I, I could, I, I could have swum back, and if that man with the boat, Dick McLaren, if Dick <laughs> would would have said, "Yes, go on, you can both be in water at the same time," I would, I'd have swum back with Michael. But it obviously weren't fair to put him in that position. She's nearly there, no. she's um, just on the way. All right. So I got it both. I did as I was told for once. Watch. Go. Hey! Well done. Back again. An hour, <laughs> an hour and a half. Well done. It's not as bad as Res. No worse. Huh? No worse than Res. What's your name? Seventeen minutes forty-nine. Well, you got to beat that, mate. And by the way, what? I did see the monster. <laughs> yes, it um, it does exist. Well, it did exist. It did exist because on April 17th, 1996, our Lynn Fronick records of Glenfield Road, Nelson, Lancashire, killed it. <laughs> and it's now for sale in the fruit shop across the road at £20 a pound. Michael then successfully made the return trip and apart from going round in circles a couple of times, it was incident free. Villagers in Waddington revived a tradition which had not taken place for more than 45 years. On Bank Holiday Monday this year, May the 27th, a Rose Queen was crowned. The last time such a ceremony was held in the village was in 1951 to commemorate the Festival of Britain. Reverend Alan Bailey introduced Anita Bater, who was a flower girl on the last occasion in 1951, to crown 13-year-old Jackie Derby of Waddington. Behind the scenes for weeks and months, thank you to them. I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mrs. Anita Baker and invite her to crown Waddington May Queen 1996. I'd like to say a warm welcome to everyone who's turned up today. <laughs> it's a great honour to be asked to crown this year's Queen, Jackie. Beautiful. As do all her entourage. You see, I now have the pleasure of crowning Jackie, and may she be the first of many more May Queens to come. but dull, but in no way did it dampen the villagers from enjoying this festive day. On 
June the 2nd this year, there were two major events taking place in Burnley. At Barden Athletic Arena, the Burnley Boys Club were having their annual fun day, with the usual stalls and rides for all to enjoy. Also, the usual participating events for young and young at heart. If you had time to dash down to Townley Park on that day, the classic car show was taking place, a real treat for the car enthusiast. Roadsters were also in attendance. Worry, the organisers of the annual agricultural show held once again at Townley Park. This had nothing to do with mag cow disease, but whether it was going to be the best show ever. The organisers had earlier warned that if there wasn't an improvement in the attendance to that of previous years, then this year's show would be the last. Their prayers were answered. The weather couldn't have been better, and it brought thousands to the park to enjoy a most glorious event. On Sunday, the 9th of June, people in the Elm Street area of the town thought they were waking up to a very cloudy morning. They were wrong. The day was actually cloudless and sunny. Thick black smoke from one of the biggest fires Burnley had ever had was coming from the three-storey Danehouse Mill. Eyewitnesses said that in the space of 10 minutes, the whole building had turned into a fireball. Roads around the area had to be closed as 15 fire crews from around the country battled to overcome the blaze. Hundreds of thousands of pounds of antiques, kitchenware and the whole of a cotton waste factory were destroyed as floors collapsed leaving a tall stone surrounding wall at the point of toppling. Antiques exporter John Waite and mill owner Richard Blackburn could only watch as their livelihood went up in smoke. Three of Mr Blackburn's workers, Ronnie Daly, Steve Morgan and Michael Waring, had to run for their lives when the fire started at about 7.43am. The fire is understood to have started when a machine in the jute factory overheated. TV cameras eventually arrived, but not soon enough to capture the scenes earlier. Our reporter, Harry Conroy, approached the television companies offering the footage he shot, but uh, they declined. Their loss was our gain. Retained firefighter Michael Nuttall was taken to Burnley General with a hand injury. Two others were slightly overcome by smoke, but otherwise there were no serious injuries. Well-earned refreshments were gladly taken, as the blaze was eventually brought under control.
Once again, we were treated to a display of model car racing, this time by the West Craven Model Car Club. Townley College was the venue, and what a glorious day it was. The difference with these cars compared to the model cars we saw earlier is that the models last month were driven by fuel. These are battery driven, but both are radio controlled. A lot quieter and less smoke was quite apparent. Eight finished. Ten finished. Nine finished. Seven finished. And the council provided some more street entertainment for those who preferred to stay at home during the Burnley annual holiday period. The state of the weather didn't deter either entertainers or shoppers. The only remaining chimney at Huncote Power Station disappeared in a cloud of dust on July 22nd. The 5,900 tonne chimney was demolished using 30 kilograms of nitroglycerine based explosive which were placed in 37 holes drilling the front piers at the base of the chimney to determine the direction it would fall. John Faulkner, explosive engineer for contractor Abel UK Limited, said It was absolutely spot on. A warm afternoon brought many sightseers to the surrounding fields to watch the Big Bang. Then at precisely 1 p.m. Oldswick held its 26th 
annual gala on August the 3rd. Roy Barraclough, Coronation Street's Alec Gilroy, open the proceedings. Roy always had time to talk to the fans and to have his photograph taken. And we need your support, and without your support coming through them gates, we could not put this day on. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Mayoress, uh, distinguished guests, uh, it's a great pleasure and, and indeed an honour for me to have been invited here to open this, the 26th uh, Barn Oldswick Gala Day. Uh, it's got a wonderful history and I feel very honoured to be here. Um, I've never been to Van Oldswick before, and when I asked my good friend Tom Howard uh, what, what it was like, he said, oh, it's, it's beautiful, actually. It's a sort of cone with O-levels. <laughs> Conversely, it could be regarded as the thinking man's burnt me. <laughs> but I've got to congratulate the, the round table for their organisation uh, of this, uh, this day. Uh, you certainly know to, uh, how to do it in Barlick. <laughs> That's all I can say. I, I'm sorry the weather uh, isn't as good as you normally have, but uh, so is your right for joining bloody Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can say that because uh, having been born in Lancashire, I've got a Yorkshire name because my father was Yorkshire, so I'm completely neutral today. Uh, I hope you all have a very good day. I'm sure you will. Uh, the main thing is for you all to have fun, enjoy it, spend as much as you can afford, and I'll be wandering around, and I'll be delighted to meet all of you. Uh, so just feel free, come up, have a chat, have an autograph, whatever. Uh, no more, we've had enough speeches. So I now declare the 26th Barlick Gala Day well and truly open. Table organisers were delighted to announce that they had not only covered the £7,000 cost of putting on the show, but made a profit of about £2,500, which will go into the kitty for local charities. Roy not only opened the event, but stayed on mixing with the crowd and signing autographs which delighted the officials. August the 3rd was also the day Burnley celebrated its first Carnival Day in more than a decade. And our reporter, David Parker, was there to record the event. People lined the procession route as the 21 floats made their way to Townley Park for the day's activities.
More than 5,000 people enjoyed the fun and games, stunt riders and camel race, raising £6,500 for Reedley Development Centre and other good causes in Burnley. As we bring our newsreel to a close, we are guilty of a little self-indulgence. On September the 9th, Burnley Sinian Video Society opened its doors to the public, inviting people in to look at things we might get up to on a Thursday night. We have reaped the fruits of our efforts by adding some more members to our ranks. There was another open day just round the corner. The former Ritzy's nightclub was becoming an eyesore and an embarrassment to the town folk of Burnley. Now this was the site back in April. Gala Bingo opened the doors on September the 9th to show off this beautiful new refurbished building. The complex provides seating for 1,636, two licensed bars with waitress service and a food court, also live entertainment. Only time will tell what knock-on effect such a facility will have on Burnley's working men's clubs, who have offered bingo to its members for years. Well folks, that's it for another year. Remember to watch out for our reporters who will be out and about again over the next 12 months, ready for Newsreel 97. And finally, as they say on the telly, a last word from our celebrities. Hello, Burnley City and Video Society. Hello, Burnley and Video. Burnley Video and Cine Society. See, I'm the dingle, I'm thick. <laughs> All the best to you. Keep up the good work. <laughs>